Well, in mingling with the Presbyterians for about 15 years now, 16, I've heard many fish stories. <laughs> Most were unbelievable. The first time I met Ernie Petrie, quite a few years ago, Ernie's quite a fisherman. He goes out of state and catches fish. He said, Alan, he said, I want to tell you about a bass I caught. He said, that thing was about that far from the bank when I caught it, and it was about that long. I said, Ernie, I, I believe that story. But this morning, I want to share with you a fish story that's more than about fish. Jesus didn't tell stories just to tell stories. There was a meaning and a purpose behind every story. And they were simple stories, plain stories, because the people he told stories to didn't have a polished education. He wanted to speak to them in a way that they could understand. So when he was around farmers, he told farm stories. When he was around people that worked in the markets, he told market stories. And now he's around fishermen. And what kind of story is he going to tell? Fish stories. This story this morning was centered around an event that took place after the resurrection. In fact, this was the, the third appearance of Jesus. He appeared... Before he ascended into heaven, he appeared 12 times. Is there any doubt about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? No. At one time, there were 500 people present when Jesus appeared. But this time, there were just a few fishermen. Simon Peter said to his six buddies, let's go fishing. It was one, it was, it, it was that lull. They had seen Jesus, but then he had left them and they didn't know what to do. So sometimes we hear this advice, when you don't know what to do, do nothing. Well, that can get you in trouble too. My grandfather used to say, an idle mind is what? He made sure that not only was my mind not idle, but my body was busy as well. In fact, if I may just get away a little bit, I think one of the real sad things that's happening today is that too many of our young people are setting as couch potatoes working their remote or their text, their cell, and, and doing their video stuff and accomplishing literally nothing. You say, well, Alan, that's pretty strong. Don't you cut him a little slack? After all, my grandson says, when he uses the internet, that's educational. Well, you see, he's an exception. <laughs> you don't believe it? Ask his grandmother. But I think, I think idleness and setting and doing nothing can be just as addictive as marijuana. Be careful. Peter said, let's go fishing. Let's just don't sit here. Let's go fishing. So they got in the boat, they, it was an evening, they got in the boat and they went out and they began to fish. And you know, what's that song the little kids sing? Fished all night and they caught no fishes. Fished all night and they caught no fishes. That's what happened. They caught no fishes. And when morning came, it began to get light, they made their way to the shore. And as they approached the shore, tired, hungry, 
discouraged, empty nets. They saw a figure standing over on the, on the shore. And they heard a voice saying, Hey guys, haven't any luck? You know, you just got to use your imagination, fishermen out on the lake. What are they biting on today? <laughs> eh? <laughs> and Jesus said, you caught any fish? And the reply was, we have caught nothing. Our labor has been in vain. Now, can you identify with that? Have you ever worked all day and you took two steps forward and three steps backwards? Can you identify with that? And Jesus simply said, and they didn't know it was Jesus. They couldn't, they couldn't see him in the, in the beginning of, of daylight. Jesus said, cast your net on the right side of the boat. Now, here, here is the crux of my sermon this morning. What happened would not have happened if they had not obeyed. And there's a lot of things in our life that will not happen if we don't obey. But a lot of good things happen when we do obey. And the last song that we're going to sing this morning is Trust and Obey. You know, in spite of their tiredness, in spite of their discouragement, there must have been something penetrating about that voice. But Simon said, let's humor him. What do we got to lose? What's one more cast? Ernie, have you ever been so tired, but you thought, I'll go over there where that neck is, and those weeds are sticking. I'm just going to try one more time. So they threw their nets on the right side of the boat. Woo! Guess what happened? All of a sudden, they felt a tug in those nets, and they realized that they were catching fish. And they finally got them up and in the boat, and John, who is so precise and exact, and he wanted to make sure that we had a really accurate account of what was going on, he said there were 153 large fish. And the miraculous part of it, according to John, was that these large fish did not break the net. That fish like this usually shred the net. Betsy, in your scripture reading in Revelation, it says something about that the Lord has dominion over the air and the land and the sea. And did the Spirit of God come upon those waters and direct those fish to come right over there to the right side of the boat and be there when the fishermen cast their nets? And put them in a spirit of quietness so they did not thresh around like fish usually do. And they got them in the boat. And John whispers to Peter, that voice that we heard, it's the Lord. And Jesus said, I know you're tired. I know you're hungry. Bring the boat in. I've got a meal cooked for you. And they brought the, the boat in, brought their fish in. Now this is, this is the gospel according to Mason. Those 153 fish Simon Peter and John said, now we're going to go over and we're going to sit and we're going to visit with the Lord, but let's get someone to clean those fish. <laughs> oh, Ernie, the best part of a fishing trip 
is when you can get someone to clean your fish. That's, that's the winner, right? <laughs> and, and take them to market. Now, these were Jewish fishermen. And they were slack in making a dollar. And those 153 fish were worth something. So the fish went off to market, and those seven guys sit around the fire, and they listen to Jesus. They were kind of like Mary, you know, Mary and Martha. They were like Mary who sat and listened to Jesus. And here's the most important part, probably, of my sermon. It's not about fish. It's about the conversation. Now that's about to take place between Jesus and Peter. And Jesus looks over to Simon and he said, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And, and, and Peter said, yes, Lord, I, I love you. And he said, feed, feed my sheep. And a little bit later in a conversation, Jesus turned to Peter again and he said, Simon, do you, do you love me? And Peter again said, yes, Lord, you, you know I love you. And as I read this again and again and again, I thought sometimes we let, we let so much fluff enter our religious experience that we, we fail to realize that probably the most important question we could ever be asked if we had a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus and he said to us, and he called you by name and he said, do you love me? What a question. And we would all probably affirm. We're pretty good with affirmations. We're kind of short on commitment, but we like, we're, we're good, you know, Presbyterians are great on affirmations. Yes, Lord, yay, we love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And look, look there. <laughs> What, did, what, does, what does the Lord mean for us when he said, feed my sheep? And that was twice. And now Jesus is about to ask Simon the question the third time. Well, you know, you know the why. Because remember when, when, when Simon Peter was warming his hands outside of the courtyard when Jesus was on trial? And one of the soldiers said to Jesus, oh, you look like one of his followers. And Peter said, I am not. And a little bit later, a little lady said to Jesus, are you sure the way you talk is kind of similar to that Galilean in there that they've arrested? Are you sure you're not a follower? And Peter again said, I am not. That's twice. See, we're, we're getting to the third time, aren't we? Have you heard this expression, what comes around goes around? <laughs> uh. And finally, Peter denied the Lord three times. Then he heard what? Come on. What did he hear? Huh? Right, Linda. Heard a rooster crowing. Well, that's, a, that's another sermon. That's another story. But the third time... Jesus turns and he looks at Peter and he said, Simon, and he called him the son. He wanted to make sure Peter knew who he was and Peter did. Do, do you really? And he must have asked it in such a way that it, it got to Peter. Well, when someone asks you a question three times, it, it's like, are you hard hearing or what? Didn't you hear me the first two times I told you I loved you? But Peter, but Jesus wanted to really affirm Peter's devotion to him. And he said, Peter, do you honest and truly, do you really love me? 
And Simon affirmed that he did. And Jesus said, Feed my lambs and my sheep. Covers about the whole thing, doesn't it? Boys and girls, new Christians, lambs, sheep, us older people. <laughs> Covers everybody. Peter was given a commitment to feed these people. Jesus had them cast their net on the other side of the boat, and they caught fish. We have some good fishermen here at First Presbyterian Church. Fishermen and fisherwomen. I guess we ought to be all inclusive, hadn't we? And they've been casting their nets faithfully. <coughs> but you know something? They pull them back in. And for the most part, the nets are empty. And yet we're faithful. We just keep on fishing. Hoping that one day there might be a fish in there. And we look over on the other side of the lake. Now hear me, Ernie. We look over on the other side of the lake. And we see them catching fish. We see the rock and we see Orchard Field. Man, they're, they're catching fish over there. And why are they catching fish and, and, and we're not catching fish? Well, maybe it's because they cast their net on the right side of the boat. Are you listening to me? And I would say the Presbyterians, maybe we ought to do something different. I know we like tradition, but maybe we ought to try the right side of the boat for a change. We don't cast our net on the right side of the boat. We've never done it that way before. Well, however, we need to have a method. And we need to have a method or a way to catch fish. Our new pastor is coming on board in June. He will be at the helm of our ship. But who will be the fishermen and the fisherwomen? Me and you. And he will say, in regard to new programs and new ideas, kind of like casting your net in a different direction, and it's time for us to listen and say, you know, maybe, maybe that will work. Maybe we can catch fish that way. Maybe that is a direction that, that, that we should go. Let's try it. Let's, let's do it. Let's be ready for whatever comes our way. I pray this morning that God would give us a vision, touch our spirit and quicken us to realize that there's fish out there in those waters just waiting to be caught. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would give us a sense of direction that we can find the lure and a way to entice them to bring them in. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I pray that God will help us to fill our nets. God bless.